All right. All right. Well, I have changed the way I do the recording, so this way is, this is a lot more reliable because the new way of doing recording is to do it by streaming. Okay. So, we, so I only have to do one thing is to make sure that it is actually streaming. So let me log into oh, different account. There we go. Some props. There we go. So yes, you guys can count the number of characters in my password. <laughs> that might work. That, that will work eventually. <laughs> Given enough time, it will work. All right, so let's see. Where's my streaming stuff? Uploads, live streams, there we go. Okay, so this is the new way of doing screen recording in this class, is I am actually streaming, which means you know, at the end of the class, I don't have to save the file, I don't have to upload the file, it is all going to be on the server, you know, like right away, with a two minute lag, I think, yeah. okay? So, which is kind of cool. I'm just hoping that people won't start to like not come to class because A, I can just watch it from home, having my dinner at the same time, right? Would you ever consider getting like a camera, like to show the board and stuff? Like a camera? To show the board and stuff. Oh. <laughs> Body cam. <laughs> then you guys can see <laughs> yourselves, <laughs> right? I can use a document camera. Remember, I got that document camera thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it just takes a lot of time to set it up. That's why I, I kind of stopped using it. But if you, if it is useful, we can do that. So, <laughs> you really useful? Pascal's triangle, but. Pascal's triangle? Yeah, we just talked about it. I logged in. He was watching. I was watching. Oh. Now I'm, I'm doing my own learning. You've been watching the live stream? Yeah. Oh, that is cool. I hope you were not driving at the same time. I learned. I didn't learn. What are the ways? Driving while thing? learning the binomial theorem may be hazardous to your health. Right? Yeah. Cool. Well, there were there were a few parts where I did not use uh, the projector. I was doing something on the whiteboard. So did did you did you get most of it? Like because there were certain parts where I just used the whiteboard. Now yeah, that's what I was saying. Like some stuff, and then you can't hear some students, so you can't really hear what they're saying. Ah, uh, okay. So basically, you know, I need to tell them to speak up. Ed Cole, the question from the students. Okay. Okay. What about the homework assignment? How many people have gotten started with the homework assignment? Okay, sort of. <laughs> Starting means you know understanding what it is asking you to do and understanding all the pieces that you're given with. I got as far as attempting to log into the server, but it Okay. Yes, that's because of my mistake. <laughs> Yeah, I made a mistake because um, I forgot to change the expiration date of those accounts. So they all expired in 2014. <laughs> and that, that's why none of you were able to log in. I, I just changed them to, um, to a more reasonable uh, expiration date. So you should be able to see it now. Ah. I think this is the way it's supposed to set up, but I'm not even sure whether we'll need this or not. Okay. This is actually 440. It's from the previous class. The one from for this class is going to be 310. All right. So from here on, you know, there won't be any chances that I'll be running out of disk space, you know, and that sort of thing. Okay. So, which is good. All right. So let me check and make sure. Okay, the script is all done. Um, that means you know if you try now, you should be able to sign in using the full last name, first initial, and your student ID as your password. Okay, thank you. Thank you for conf confirming. Yep. I was gonna say you should make uh, playlists on YouTube. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, like when, I was, when I was studying, I kept, like, trying to, like, parse through all the... Oh, videos. okay. Well, you can always create your own playlist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can share your playlist with other people, too, because you can make it public. Now, it's too much trouble for me to actually make the playlist. You guys can do it. <laughs> because the, uh, it's already kind of sorted, so it's not too hard to kind of locate the one previous and stuff, stuff like that. OK, so getting back to the homework assignment. OK, so the objective of the homework assignment is what again? Let me, let me go to the homework description so that we can at least see what you're supposed to do, what is the objective of the homework assignment. So let's go back to Moodle. And go to the homework. It sounds really bad because you have to come up with the micro code of a few instructions. And then you have to kind of figure out how many bit shift do I need to do and stuff like that. So it sounds pretty bad, but it's not. I would say the worst part of this homework assignment is to read my code. Because once you read my code, you understand what the library subroutines are doing, you just have to kind of adapt a solution into yours. OK, so this is your homework assignment. Um, the power account to your description should work now, because I just you know, changed the expiration date from 2014 to 2017, so that might help. <clears throat> so the second part is to get the files that you need. Um, you will need processor WDPC with direct PC or program counter access. Um, the ALU.circ, registerbank.circ, those are what you need. And then this particular file is a tar file, which means you, know, it, you have to use a tar command to untar that. Or you, if you use 7-zip, you will be able to, un, uh, you, you can unzip it as well in Windows if you have 7-zip the program, okay? But my recommendation is to use a Linux type environment to work on this because there's a make file. It's already fully set up for you and you just need to use the make file. It's, it's a lot easier to go that route, I think, than to try to get, get it to work into this. Okay? So, so the command to decompress the opcodes file is tar xzvf opcodes.tar. Um, I can repeat all of these things, you know, today, you know, on my own command line, so it's recorded. I think I did it last time too, so it's going to be uh, online as well. And to do this homework assignment, you will need the Make Utility program. It is on the Power Server already. So if you're on Power, all of this stuff is already set up. <clears throat> and you can get a port of that in Windows, but I don't know. I have no idea where you can download it. So the actual core of your homework assignment is to implement. Um, the microcode of a few instructions, six of those to be exact, okay? But once you figure out the first one, they're all pretty much the same. It should be six because, because there are five conditional branches plus the unconditional one. Yeah, so there, there should be six of those. Okay. And so what you need to do is to look at one of the programs that I have already written. So you want to pick the instruction or the instructions that are the closest to the one that you want to implement. Okay, and then try to figure out, okay, how does that work? Yes, go ahead. So in uh, your files, you have a file called ld.c and you have ldi.c. Because those are two different there. instructions. Okay, so now in our homework, mm -hmm. we have already GMP written, and now mm -hmm. we need to re write GMPI. Is it yes. the same as you're doing LD to LDI? Um, well, let's check. Okay, so that's a good question. So let's go ahead and see how we can answer that question. Okay, so what you need to do is to refer to the opcodes spreadsheet, which is in the shared folder that you have access to. This is the Google shared folder. Um, so in, the, in, the sh in this particular document, I explain what is the LDI instruction. You know, row 20 is the LDI instruction, and then row 21 is the LD instruction. They are different, okay? Because the LDI instruction is loading whatever the program counter is pointing to into a specific register. But the other one is using some register, A, B, C, or D, 
at whatever location it points to, basically is Y, is going to be stored in register X. So in your jump instruction, you don't have any registers. Remember, you don't have any registers in your jump instructions. All the J blah 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 I instructions do not use any registers. So I would say LD has no relevance to your homework assignment. Okay. So you want to look at these instructions, the way it's described, and find out which one has the most relevance. In other <laughs> words, you look at the one that, okay, we'll just pick, you know, uh, jump I, J, J M P I or jump immediate. In other words, the instruction itself specifies where you're supposed to go without consuming one register to do that, okay? So the first question is, how is that different compared to just J M P? Because in order to make your homework, you know, in order to solve the problem in your homework, you, you can start from scratch if you want to, but you can also just look at the jump instruction and then figure out, okay, how is the JMPI instruction different from the jump instruction itself, which is down here. And I cannot display both at the same time. That's okay. I can manipulate the spreadsheet to do... Oh, eh, eh. Move this line. Ah, no. Control back. Okay. It's this one that I need to move. There we go. Okay. So, what I did was I split the uh, display of the spreadsheet into two halves so that the top half can stay with the JMPI instruction. And then I can throw the bottom half to the JMP instruction so now they're lined up right next to each other. Is that okay? So how are they related? Well, the program counter got changed, right? The JMP instruction, which is already implemented, is using one of the four registers, A, B, C, or D, to update the program counter. That's what the X is. Is that okay? Your implementation of JMPI is going to use whatever the program counter is currently pointing to to update itself. So you have to make some changes to the code, to the microcode of jump to accomplish the new uh, instruction. Is that okay? So now that you know that, hey, we know how to do a JMP, we have the file to do the JMP, so now the question is, let's figure out how that works first. Once you figure out how JMP works, then you can go back and say, ah, okay, I can see that we can still use all of these particular bit patterns here from jump, but we have to change these few ones so that it becomes JMPI. So that's going to be the approach that I'm going to do because, you know, or you can start from scratch if you wish to. Okay. So now that we know what we're looking for, because what, what we're going to do is we will look into jump itself, figure out what it does, and then we go back to implement jump I. Is that okay? All right. Okay, cool. Two things we can do at this point. Okay, so let me go back to my command prompt here. Go to processor, go to opcodes, which is already done. And I'm just going to show you the source code of jmp.c, which is already implemented in works. Okay, so it gives you a whole bunch of bit fields. Okay, each one is basically a bit field. It can be representing one or more bits. Okay, so this can this is the first. Um, okay, let me move the cursor to indicate which one. This is the first item, second item, third item, fourth item, and so on. So the next question is, um, what are we talking about here? Okay, what, what, what do you mean the first item? What do you mean by the second item? So I will show you a trick in VI, which I find is kind of helpful. Um, okay, so when you use VI, you can, uh, you can specify a dash uppercase O to display side by side or a lowercase o to display up and down. So it splits it, you know, differently. I'm, I can, I'm choosing to split vertically, okay? So it's left, right. The left-hand side is gonna be jmp.c, the right-hand side is gonna be uCode.c, which is not something that you have to change, okay? So do not change anything in uCode.c, but it is gonna be useful to see how the function works, okay? So that's why I'm gonna display both of these, okay? So now we have both of these programs, and I guess we can use a little bit more space. Unfortunately, it doesn't really um, resize dynamically, but that's good. That's good enough. 
All right, so when you, so first of all, we want to figure out how are these slices utilized? Because the slices is basically a two-dimensional array that is initialized. That's basically what it is. The question is, how are these utilized? So when you look at the subroutine here, do not change the structure of the program, okay? You, all, you want to start with read ROM, you always want to end with write ROM. And in between, you can change the write slice you know, call. The first call is using slices bracket zero, which means it's using this bunch of stuff to specify an array to pass to the subroutine called write slice. The second one is using the other slice or the second slice. This is the base code of your opcode. Um, in, some of the, in some of the instructions, the base code is only specifying you know, the general pattern, but because you can specify xx and yy as registers, there are variants of that opcode. And that's why you know, we have um, the x being 2, or you know, there's no xx, no yy, that sort of thing. Because if you do utilize the x register and the y register, there will be 16 variants of that instruction. I'm not sure whether that's making sense or not. Let's, 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 look, let's, look, let's look at the add instruction. Okay. Stop my instinct of using the, the whiteboard. Okay, so let's look at the add instruction. So let's see here. And the add instruction has an opcode of, oh, where is it? Okay, this is the add instruction. The add instruction has an opcode that is based on 1000 as the most significant 4 bits, but the least significant 4 bits specify which registers is used in that instruction. So that means I have 16 variants of this particular instruction. The first one is uh, using register A as XX, register A as YY. So XX is 00, zero YY is also 00. zero so now we have 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 as the actual opcode. That will be 8, 0. The next variant is going to have xx being 0, 0, yy being 0, 1 to specify register B. So that opcode is going to be 8, 1. Then we have 8, 2, 8, 3, all the way up to 8, F for the 16 variants. So now that we understand there are 16 variants to some of these instructions, especially the ones that make use of both registers. So when we go back to this code here, the, um, okay, let me, I'm just trying to find out you know, what is the best way to display that. Okay, maybe here. So the offset, this number here, the third parameter to write slice is basically specifying if it is not no xx in this case, is telling me you know, where to find xx. How many bit shifts do I need to do to find xx? Two bits in this case. Okay, so I have to left shift two bits in order to find xx. What if I don't need xx? You specify no underscore xx. So this parameter, along with the next one, allows write slides not only to write a single opcode, it will basically write all the variants of the same opcode. Because otherwise, I would have 16 add instructions, right? And I tell myself, I don't want to you know, deal with that manually. So instead, I just wrote this code, write slice can automatically take care of that. Is that relevant to you for your homework assignment? The answer is yes and no, okay? The yes part is, well, you still have to pass a parameter, so you need to know what it does and what to pass to it, right? The no part refers to, are we using registers in the blah, 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 I instruction? No. So you need to find out how to specify, do not use, there, there are no XX registers, there are no YY registers, okay? How do we find that out? Well, go look at one of the instructions that does not use xx or yy and see how it, what kind of parameter it passes. JC or JO doesn't use uh, parameters? JO does. I mean, there's one option to just give PC, just give PC. That's only one of the options, but as an opcode, it does use a register. 
The way we know that is when you look at the instruction, there's xx inside the opcode itself. So we do specify xx. So which instruction does not use a single register at all? We are staring at it right on top of a jump i. No off and halt. Okay, so look up halt.c and find out what you pass as those two parameters. Okay, it should be pretty obvious. I mean, when you look at it, it's like, oh, so that's why it's called. <laughs> <laughs> but that's but this is how you this is how you figure out you know how to use those subroutines instead of actually reading the entire definition of right slice. You can look at how it is utilized by the other instructions. Yep, go ahead. So uh, I'm still kind of not getting it. So um, can, you open, uh, can you open the, uh, uh, the file that you are showing? Uh-huh. Yeah, right here. So for, uh, for the two and the no y, y, is that like you move to the left and then the no y, y can like be only uh, use uh, x, x, the location? Yep. No YY means literally no YY. So, what about the, the number two? The number two, okay, but so when you, you're referring to this parameter, right? Yep. Okay, let me put the cursor over there to highlight it. So, you're, you're, you're talking about this two, okay. right? It's the third parameter. Yep. So, when you look at the definition of the subroutine, which is on the right hand side, right slice, third parameter is called xx offset, right? This is the name of that parameter. So now you basically look at xx offset and say, how is that used? Okay. It's used right here. It controls a loop. So so when you look at this condition, what what it is what is it saying? I mean, this is obviously a for loop, okay? What is the condition to stay in the loop? This is the entire condition to stay in the loop, but what is it really saying? Okay, there we go. It's a ternary operator where the condition is xx offset equals equals no xx. What if that is true? What, what is going to be your boundary of, the, of this loop? What is the condition to stay in the loop when xx offset is no xx? Yep, exactly. You stay in the loop as long as x is less than 1. x is initialized to 0. And this is a loop. You know, what do I do at the end of each iteration? This is the reason why we have four loops instead of, instead of just using y loops. What do we do to x after each iteration? The third part of the four, which is plus plus x, we increment x, right? So what does it mean when we say you stay in the loop as long as x is less than one? What is it? What is it really effectively saying? <coughs> do it once, exactly. There's no loop, okay? Just do it once, okay? Is that part okay? Why do what? Why is there a loop to begin with? I'm only trying to write a single slice of microcode to the file, okay? To the to actually the ROM, simulated ROM. But why do I have a loop here? What happens when x x offset is not no xx? What is the boundary condition to stay? In, what? How do I stay in the loop in that case? X is less than four. Okay, so why do we want x to iterate through zero, one, two, and three? What is x anyway? What is xx representing in the opcodes? Okay, just in the spreadsheet that you can still see. What what is xx representing? The two bits to specify a register. Can be a, b, c, or d, right? Same as y, y. So why do you think I'm iterating through, you know, if xx offset is something other than no xx, can be two, can be zero, can be four, but in all of those cases, x will iterate from zero all the way to three, when it becomes four, we exit the loop. It's for me so that I can generate slices of all the variants of that instruction. Is that making any sense? 
do you need variants of each instruction? Are you using registers? No. You're not using registers. So how do you tell this subroutine and say that we don't have variants, we are not using registers? Make xx offset? Exactly. So use the constants, right? Okay, so there we go. So that explains the mystery of oh, why is there no yy? Because certain instructions do not have yy registers. Okay. Okay. Good. So now we want to look at slides. Okay, the offset, yeah, we'll explain that later. It's easy. But we want to know what is this slice doing. Okay. So this slice is a is an array, okay? And it doesn't get used until much later. Okay, so I just search for slice. There we go. So slice is used over here. Okay, let me just point out where we are talking about. It is here. So you can you can see that slice is used you know, as an array. It is indexed by bit field index. Okay, is that okay? Then we want to say, but what does it mean? What about this thing over here? What about bit field of microcode? U code as an array. It is already initialized. Let's see how U code is used. So U code is also indexed. Do you see how slice, which is indexed up here, and U code, which is indexed down here, do you see how they are using the same index? Right? They're both using bit field index as an index, which basically means the order of the items in your slice is going to match the order of U code as an array. Is that okay? Sort of? Are we still understanding the code at this point? <coughs> no? Yes? <laughs> I get some pretty ambiguous feedback here. Okay, so let's say you're, you, you, you get this part, okay? So somehow, you know, the, the elements of slice is synchronized with the elements of U code. So now you want to look at U code and say, okay, what is in U code, okay? So U code looks like this. Um, it has got, you know, a bit width, okay? So this is basically specific. the first number specifies the width of that particular thing. The second number specifies the offset to that specific thing. And then the third one is just a name for that thing, which is never really which is never really used in the algorithm. But I put it here just so that I can remind myself what that thing is about. Is that okay? So the first row, let me highlight the entire row first. So this row is basically saying um, U-code pointer reset, okay, which is the name of that one single bit, has a width of single one, and it is bit 25. Okay, let's pick another one. Uh, let's pick something that has more than one bit. Uh, pick something that has three bits, this guy here over here. So this one is called ALUOP. Have we seen that tunnel before? It's in the process of design. Okay, so all of these names except for 102 are actual names that we use in the design. The other ones simply have no tunnels, and that's why there are no names for those names. So ALUOP is starting at bit 16. How wide is ALUOP? It's three bits wide because we have five different operations in the ALU to choose from. So we need at least you know, three bits to do it. Are we doing okay so far? So that means you know when you look at the processor architecture and you figure out, oh, I need this thing to be a one, that thing over there to be a zero, and this thing over here to be two bits, you know, one, one, you go back to here and then you can now start, start to specify how a slice is done, okay? So the values that you need in your instructions will be specified here in the same order as these items over here. Are we doing okay so far? Doing okay? Okay. The flow of the, the work, what you need to do? Okay. All right, okay. 
So the next thing we'll do is I'm just going to um, run the JMP instruction so that you can actually see the microcode of the jump instruction in action. One of those is really useful. The second one seems to be like, why, how come all of the instructions end with that slice? Except for one, there's a reason. Okay, so we'll go ahead and look at the JMP instruction actually in action. Okay, and this time I'm not gonna use the assembler to assemble the program. I'm gonna do it myself by hand, just so that we know how to do it by hand as well. So the program, let me use a mouse pad here. The program is going to be something like this. Uh, we'll say begin. It's going to be an infinite loop. Uh, we say no op, JMP, uh, LDI begin, oops, A begin, and then JMP A. So this is going to be the program that I will test run in the simulator, but I want to assemble this program by hand instead of using my spreadsheet. My spreadsheet works just fine, but I do want to show you guys how to do this by hand so that you know, oh, okay, so this is what we need to do if there's no assembler. So the first thing we need to do is to find out what is the opcode of no op? All zeros, okay, zero, zero, that's one byte. What about the opcode of LDI A blah, blah, blah? Okay, so we need, we need to look it up. So LDI is right here. So LDI specifies that we have 0, 1, 1, 0 as the most significant 4 bits and then 1, 1, x, x as the least significant 4 bits. But since we have register A, which is 0, 0, so the entire opcode is 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. Okay? So that's the opcode, which is also known as 6C. Okay? So we have 6C. But then it needs a second byte to specify the, act, the actual constant. So if I want this program to be at location 0, to begin at location 0, the label begin is going to be the symbolic name of the address 00. zero. So the second byte is going to be 00. zero. Are we still doing OK so far with this process? Can you re-explain that last part? Yes. OK, so the LDI instruction, when you look at the LDI instruction, it has basically two parts, okay? Even though I only wrote one single expression, but there are two distinct phases. The first phase is to dereference PC and then into RAM, and then copy that byte into the register X. That's the first phase. The second phase is to increment the program counter. Is that okay? Sort of? Okay. All right, so given that is what we are doing, um, where is this I? This I is whatever the program counter is pointing to. But the program counter is always pointing to, quote unquote, the next instruction to execute, which is the byte right after the opcode that we are executing. And where is that going to be? It's the next byte. So that means you know, we have 6C as one opcode, but as we decode and execute the opcode 6C, the program counter is already pointing to the next location. And we want that next location to store the constant that we'll be using to copy to register X. Okay. So zero, 0 is next after 6C. So it's pointing to zero, 0, 0, 6C. PC initially points to the byte of 6C so that we can fetch the instruction, put it into the instruction register. Okay. And then the next thing we do is we quote unquote decode it, which means you know, we pack four zeros to 6C, so it becomes 6C0. And that's where we start the execution of the microcode slices in the music box. Right? But at that point, the program count is also incremented to the byte next to 6C, the byte after 6C that byte is going to be copied to the register X. In this case, register X is register A. So that's why it's taking two bytes. It's taking six, one byte for 6C, which is the opcode itself, but it's also taking one more byte for the constant that we are copying into register A. Okay, all right. So now we 
are almost done with assembling this program. The last one is JMPA. So we look up this table, find out where it's JMP. JMP is down here. <clears throat> it takes one single reg uh, it takes one register, which is XX. But since we're using register A, XX is going to be zero zero. So the opcode is zero. Uh, excuse me, one zero one one, which is a B, and then zero 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 one, which is a one. So it, it's basically B one as a byte. But we still do okay so far with that process. I mean, you guys don't have to be able to convert from binary to base 16 as quickly as I do, because I've been doing this for many, many years. Okay, I've been teaching here since 2000, which is 17 years. And then on top of that, I have been doing embedded system programming for eight years prior to that. So 25 years of dealing with binary and hexadecimal numbers. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to think too much about it. It's like driving a stick shift to me. So you don't have to be able to do it as quickly, but you have to understand the process. Okay, that is the important part. So six uh, B one is what we need. So we put a B one here. So that's the entire program. Zero zero as the first byte, which is a no op instruction. Six C zero zero to represent L D I A begin because the label begin is really representing the address of zero. So it's the same thing as zero itself. And then the last instruction is JMPA, which is B1. So this is what we need. I have just manually assembled the program. Now it's time to get started with the simulator itself. Um, I can start from here. Uh, you need to use the generic version for this particular homework assignment. And I will start with the new processor design, you know, because you know that's what you'll be using for yours as well. Okay. So do a reset first. Okay. Always remember to do a reset first, and then go to the RAM location. And well, with this one, we can just go ahead and change these locations. Zero zero is still zero zero. The next one is six uh, C, and then a zero zero again. And then the last one is a B1. Oh, B, oh, B1. There we go. Okay. So this is our entire program. The 00, zero is not a big deal. You know, it doesn't really do much. Um, the 6C is important. So we kind of want to know how the LDI instructions work. Okay. So now we can single stop. We can single step through this program. One of the things you can do to help you debug the program is to, is to go to simulate and then go to logging. And when you're in logging, you basically can select any one of these or a subpart of these things to log. You can log into a file, you can log into a table. I would log into a file so you can look back in later on if you need to. So if you're interested in, okay, I want to know how the instruction register is getting changed, add it to the list. Um, I want to know the program counter because the program counter obviously is going to change and it is important. Add it to the log. I want to know the micro code pointer. You know, how is it getting changed? Okay, so you can basically add all of these things. Now, when it comes to the components that are included in uh, Logisim, such as the ROM module, so you can go to the ROM module. Okay, where's the ROM module? Oh, I guess we cannot select the wrong module because that's kind of too bad because it is actually kind of important. But you can select the other things too. You can select the address bus if you want to. Okay, if you want to know what is happening on the address bus or the data bus, you can you can specify the D you know onto this side. And when you look at the components that we designed, you know we can look into the register bank, and then you can select register A, which is the first register and include that in the log as well. In other words, every single time you know, something on this list gets changed, it will be logged in the file. And then you can debug the program by looking back into the trace and figure out, oh, I thought at this step this is supposed to be changed to that. How come it's not? Okay, so you can, you can go back and, and back trace your program. All right, so we'll, we'll go ahead and specify something like that here. Close the window. When you close the window, it will still do the logging. It's just the configuration screen is gone. Okay, so now we are ready to get started. 
Okay, control T, control T, and we can see that in the microcode, we are now on the second location. And the second location is the is the decode. The first one is the fetch, the second is the decode. The fetch is basically going into memory, in this case our RAM, read the opcode and put it into the instruction register. That is referred to as the fetch operation of an opcode. The second one, which is what is highlighted here, is called a decode operation. So the decode operation involves copying the instruction register, which is this guy here, into here, but we are not really copying. What we are really doing is we're padding four zeros to the right-hand side, and then we store it into the microcode pointer. That is called decoding, because now we are using the opcode to find out, okay, what are the what are the slices of microcode that is corresponding to this opcode? So that's called decoding, okay? So single step one more time, and we should see microcode pointer getting changed, okay? And it's getting changed back to zero. Is that surprising to you? What is the first opcode? The first opcode is a no op, which writes an opcode of zero zero. So that's why we're getting back to zero zero. Okay? So zero zero or you know, the location zero 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 and zero zero one in this ROM is both the fetch and decode slices and also the no op instruction at the same time. Because the no-op instruction is just doing that. It's just like, okay, let's go ahead and decode it. I mean, uh, let's fetch and then decode. But it can go back to itself. Is that okay? So the other thing you, want, you might want to observe is this bit pattern here is also incrementing the program counter. How do we know it's gonna be incrementing the program counter? It is already being selected, and this is ROM, and we know this ROM is always selected, which means whatever this bit pattern is, is already orchestrating the rest of the processor. Let's figure out what it's doing right now, specifically to the, um, the program counter. So the, to the program counter, oh, I take it back. The program, and program counter enable is actually off right now. It is the second instruction, the second code to uh, increment it. So this one doesn't quite do that. This one just reads it in from RAM. How do we know this is going to read it from RAM? Okay. I think this part should be enough to show you why it is reading from RAM. RAM cell is a one. Okay. So first of all, RAM cell is one, which means we're doing something with RAM. RAM load is one as well, which is a read operation. So we know we are reading from RAM. What is driving the address bus? What is controlling which part of RAM are we reading? It's the program counter, but how do we know it is the program counter? So you have to track down the address line going into the RAM, which is this one here. Ah, but it stops at a MUX. So what do you do when a, when a wire stops at a MUX? You you have to choose, you have to figure out which input is connected to this output, right? So how do you do that? You look at the selection line. Okay, this is the selection line. It is it's light green, which means it's it's a one. If it's a one, that means it's using input one, which is this wire here. Where do you think this wire go to? It goes to the program counter. So we know we are using the program counter to address which location in RAM we're reading. What are we doing with that content? We are reading a byte from RAM, but what are we doing to, with that byte? We're going to store it into the uh, instruction register. But how do we know that? Well, let me track down the instruction register, which is this guy here, right? What is the light green thing going into this instruction register? What, what, which port is it connected to, the light green line? Enable, okay? What does it do? What, what is enable to a register? It makes it possible to update in the next rising edge, okay? So that means we are setting up the instruction register to be updated. Updated by what? What is the new content? That's the next question. We suspect it is connected to the RAM, but do we know that for sure? Well, let's click the input to, into the instruction register, 
and this one is without a doubt going into the data bus. Okay, so we are reading a byte from RAM and try to put it into the instruction register. Is that okay? What about the program counter? Are we going to do something about the program counter here? Nope, we're not doing anything to the program counter. We're not adding one, okay? So the program counter is not being changed at all in this case. So control T one more time, and you can see the instruction register is now a 6C, which is the LDI instruction. Okay. When you look at the ROM corresponding to the microcode, we are, we are now going to increment to the next one. So another control T will now increment to the next one. And so we'll go ahead and do this, control T. What about this one? What do you think it's going to do? It's going to do two things at the same time. The first one is it is going to update the microcode pointer based on the instruction register padded with four zeros to the right hand side. How do we know that? Well, it is always enabled, okay? So we know it's going to be updated. But what is going to update the microcode pointer? The mux is a zero which means we're using input zero. Input zero is connected to instruction as a tunnel. Instruction as a tunnel connects to the output of the instruction register. So this is how we know that we are now using whatever is in the instruction register to update the microcode pointer. Okay? What else is it going to do? Okay, we try to look for the light green lines. Okay, you are probably seeing two light green lines at the top part of the um, of this design to the left hand side. This one here and this one over here. What is this one specifying? What is this green line, light green line telling us? We're about to update the program counter. How are we updating the program counter? The input to the program counter comes from a MUX, which means there are two possible ways to update it. Which way is it? Uh, it's a zero, which means we are now using input zero of this MUX to update the program counter. Where is that connected to? It's connected to the, pro to the adder. Are we really adding? Because the, the adder can be idling and not really adding anything, because it all depends on whether PC ink is a one or a zero. Is PC ink a one or a zero? It's a one, that means we're actually adding. So this is how we know the second slice of the no up instruction is responsible to update the program counter, to auto increment the program counter, while at the same time copying the instruction register into the microcode pointer so that we are decoding the instruction. Is that okay? So this is how you track down you know, how things are done. Okay, so let's go ahead and control T so that we can see the microcode uh, pointer now go to 6C0, okay? So now we're at 6C0. We already know what the LDI instruction is supposed to do. It is supposed to use the program counter, whatever it wants to, grab that content, and then store that into whatever register that we want to store it into, right? We know that we should be storing into which register? A, which is 0, 0. Um, and we know that the program count is pointing to location two in this case because you know, that's what that's what you're seeing with PC. Okay. Do we know that we are actually accessing RAM in the correct way? Yep. RAM sound is selected, which means we are activating the RAM. RAM load is one, which means we are reading. And now we have to make sure that the program counter is the one that is driving the address bus. Okay, so here we have the program counter. The output of the program counter goes through a MUX. In this case, the MUX has a select of one, which means it is using input one to connect to the output. The output of this MUX goes to the address bus. So we know for sure that the program counter is the one that is specifying which location of RAM we are reading from, right? Now we need to make sure that register zero is going to be updated by the content at this location. So we go to the register bank, and then we ask, are we updating something in the register bank? 
Well, yes, because R I E N register input enable is a one, which does two things at the same time because it enables this particular mux, this particular multiplexer, and this particular multiplexer, according to R I mux, is reading from zero, which is this line here. This line connects to where? Where do you think it connects to? We are reading from RAM, so this has to be connecting to the data port of RAM. Are we writing to register 0 or register A so that it is 0, 0 that we are selecting in the register bank? This one is a little bit harder to read because our cell here is not really readable. I can't really click it. So you have two choices. You can either go to RI cell, which is down here, and click this RI cell and look at the value of it, 0, 0, exactly what we're expecting. Okay, so this is how you can decode, this is how you can look at the binary code of each slice of microcode and then track down in the computer architecture, in the processor architecture and find out what is it controlling and how it is doing it. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, so control T, you know, I'm just going to do a control T here, which is going to read um, 0, 0 into register A. <clears throat> and now we are, oh, okay, we, we, I just went a little bit too far because now it's getting back to the first one. So the question is, how did it get back to uh, fetch the next instruction? Okay, so let's go to the next instruction. This is a B10, which is a jump instruction. So this is a jump instruction. Um, what do you think this particular bit have? One F D one F eight zero zero eight zero. Do you what do you think this particular bit have is specifying? This is a JMP instruction. Okay. Let's read the uh, opcode description in the browser. This is a JMP instruction. So we are trying to do this. What exactly is that saying? What is X? This is A register. In this case, it is in fact register A. Um, and what are we doing with it? Yep, exactly. We're using register A to update the program counter. So the, the, the slice that we saw in the processor simulator should be doing that. In other words, we should see a path from the output of the program counter into the input of the register bank with 00, zero as the selection for the register to be updated in the register bank. Does that make sense? Oh, I, I just said it wrong, sorry. <laughs> the other way around. This should be the other way around because we are using a register, so we should see one of the outputs of the register bank to be active, and we should see the program counter enabled to be updated. Okay, so let's, let's figure out whether that is the case or not. Right, so you can see the program counter is in fact enabled. Great, okay. How is it getting updated? Well, let's see, we track down this thing, and this is the output of a MUX, so we have to use, we have to use PC MUX to figure out where it's getting the input. This time it is a one, which means it's using this thing as the input. Is that right? Okay. So the next one is related to your homework assignment. <laughs> because now we have to say, okay, so where is it getting the output to this MUX? In other words, out of the two inputs of this MUX here, which one is connected to the output? This is a zero, which means we're using input zero of the other MUX to feed into the MUX immediately before the program counter. Is that okay? Where is this thick line going into? Oh, this thick line is going into a DMUX that connects to output zero of the register bank. So we are in fact using the output of one of the registers in the register bank to update the program counter. But which one are we using? Out zero is controlled by RO zero cell or out register output zero select. I can't really pick on this one and see what it is. So we scroll down to this, these traces here, RO0 cell, click it, it's 00. So we are selecting register A 
in the register bank to be from the output of register output zero, which is going into the input of the program counter. Effectively, we are updating the program counter with register A. Is that okay? Yep. It's reflected in your uh, uCode.c. Yes. Do you remember when you showed us those patterns? Yes. So, so that means you don't have to figure out which signal is how many times you have to shift to get to which one because it's already done for you. You just have to identify which one and what value it is supposed to be. Okay. So when when I do another control T, we should see the program counter getting changed to zero. So I just did a control T. We go back to the program counter. Where is it? Program counter. Right left. Ugh. Okay. It is in fact zero. Now here comes the important part. How come every single instruction has two slices except for one? Okay, so this is one. We are done with this particular slice already. So control T will get me to the next slice, but you cannot really see that slice executing. Okay, so I'm gonna do control T. Watch the screen. Don't blink. What just happened? Do you remember that in your music box, there's one location in RAM that does exactly the same thing? You try to track it down, you, the next location should be that one, but as soon as you get there, it goes back to the beginning. It's the same mechanism. Because at the end of executing every instruction, you have to go back to the fetch, right? Because you have to get be ready to fetch the next instruction and execute the next instruction. So how do you reset the microcode pointer back to zero? That is the question. Okay, so let's track it down. This is the microcode pointer. This is how it is going to be reset to zero. Where is that line connecting to? It is not just reset. Okay, reset will do it, but this is almost the same thing as in your music box. Except in your music box, you don't have a reset line, you have a button. Okay, where is the other one going into? The other one is going to bit 25 of the output of the ROM. So as soon as that bit becomes a one, it resets the microcode pointer so that your microcode pointer start from zero again, which is the same mechanism in your music box homework assignment to start from zero again. So that's why every instruction has two slices, okay? At least two slices. The first one, to do the real job, to do the real work. The second one, so they can go back to, to location zero. But I did mention except for one instruction. Which one do you think that's gonna be? Other than no up. Hmm? Halt, exactly. Why do you think halt doesn't have that reset? What is the purpose of the halt instruction? To get stuck, right? So in order for the halt to get stuck, I probably should not be fetching the next instruction. So that's the only instruction other than no op, which is really just you know, fetch and decode, that has no um, sequence to reset the micro code pointer. Is that okay? So I think we have just seen the jump instruction itself execute, and we have seen you know the pathways going into the program counter, right? Because you know, in order to perform a jump operation, ultimately what you want to do is to change the program counter. To change the program counter, you have to control the input into the register, but that is controlled by several things. One is it's going through this mux here, which is controlled by PC mux. The second thing is if you select one, uh, input one of this mux, then you have a second mux. So this second mux is basically the, the whole point of your homework assignment <laughs> is how do you control this second mux? Because one side of the mux goes to the register. Now you have to figure out what is the other one connected to and how do you make it connect to the other one? That really is kind of the whole point of the homework assignment. But once you figure out that particular bit pattern, you still have to change the bits in the 
ah, in the source code here. So you, you will have to figure out how to change these individual uh, items inside a slice in order to get the instruction implemented. So is that helping you guys to kind of get started? Several of those are MUX control lines, yes. So you have, to, you have to find out which one is which one. But fortunately, the good thing is the names are on this side. So when you see blah, 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 MUX, you know, it is probably controlling a MUX. Or when you see cell, you know, some of the cell are controlling MUXs as well. So you just have to find the name of the ones that you need to control. Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, index zero on uh, you chose uh -huh. with the index zero or num slices yes. zero. Yep, correct. So whatever you specify as a slice, the first item yeah. or index zero yes. corresponds to microcode pointer reset. Oh, so that's the one that actually reset to. Yep. Okay. Yep. And you can see that the second slice of the jump instruction is the one that sets it. Because you need it to go back to location zero. Okay. So is that giving you guys a, an idea of how to get this to work? Sort of. Kind of. <laughs> what about the other ones? What about the conditional ones? Aren't those a lot more difficult to specify, or are they about the same? The conditional ones, like JL versus JLI, you know. Okay, let's let's check out the other ones. Okay, so this one is JMP, right? So let's compare JMP to JL. This is JL. This is JMP. Do you, do you see how different they are? Or they're only changed by two numbers, right? So let me A, B. A, B. <laughs> okay, so only two of those numbers got changed. So now you have to track down, okay, what are those things corresponding to? They are the fourth and the fifth item, or item three and item four, okay? So let's see what item three is doing. Item three is PC mux mux. That is this seven over here. And then item four is address mux which is this one here. So now you have to say, okay, what does it mean when we have seven as PC mux mux as opposed to four for PC mux mux? So how, how do you know that? You cannot tell it from this particular source code. Where do you need to go? The processor architecture. Okay, so let's switch back to the processor architecture and then track down PC mux mux, not just PC mux, but PC mux mux. Is this one here? So we go back and say, oh, okay, PC mux mux is utilized over here. So PC mux mux is used to select one of these inputs to become the output. The output is PC mux in this case, and also PC ink in this case. All right. Um, when it is seven, what happens when PC mux mux is seven? What is it going to do? PC mux becomes a one because the seventh input to the box is a constant one. <laughs> what about PC ink? It's also guaranteed to be a one. Okay, very good. So that's your regular JMP instruction. What about the JL instruction where PC box box is a four? What is it going to do? It will select input four as the input of the boxes, right? So if PC box box is a four, then this line is going to be the input selected for this MUX here, which means PC MUX is now connected to this wire. It also means PC ink is connected to this wire. So PC MUX becomes PC ink when PC MUX MUX is a 4. Okay. What do you think this wire is corresponding to? This wire right here wire 4 to the MUX. Where does it connect to? It connects to flags 
that's that, that's flex in. The flex in is connected to the output of flex. Okay. And what flex are we talking about? Yep, we're talking about those flags. We're talking about CZ, SOL, okay? So how do we know which flag is number four? There are five flags, zero, one, two, three, four, but which one is which one? Look inside, look inside the ALU. Okay, very good. So we, we need to look, in, look into the ALU and look for flags in to see which one is which one. So we want to look at ALU, and we want to check out flex in, which is down here somewhere. Flex in is right here. Uh, this is just splitting it into C and O over here, but we are interested in bit four of flex in. So let's go ahead and check out where else we are using flex in. Um, okay, let's click it. So this way it will be highlighted when I see it. Uh, flex in. There's a flex out, which is for the most part the same thing. Flex. Um, that's good. Well, this kind of helps you too, because if the flex out is arranged the same way, so you can see that you know, number four is the exclusive or of what? The sign flag and the old flag, which means it is the L flag. Yep. So there you go. So this is the, the nice thing of you know being open source because you guys can actually track down everything that it does. And you can single step too. So you can single step, look at what is happening, okay? Look at the actual um, microcode slice, figure out what is one, what is zero, and then double check those connections are in fact the ones getting set up and then execute the instruction. Okay? Now, I wouldn't do this like you know for a really long big program, okay? But for a small program like this, it is really helpful because it really helps you understand how the microcode engine is going to coordinate everything that the processor itself does. So now we want to go back to the main part of this because we have already executed a few instructions. In fact, we're back to the beginning of the entire loop. We're back to location zero. So we have done one single iteration already. So now we can go back to the debugger or the logging. It doesn't really have a debugger, but it has a logging capability. And we want to look at the table. This is what the table looks like. And the order of these things is corresponding to the selection order. So the first one is the instruction register. And it makes sense because the first instruction is a no op instruction. It has got the op code of zero. The second instruction, which is this one here, is 6C, which is our LDI instruction. The third instruction is a jump instruction, which is a J, uh, which is a B1, and this is a B1 pattern. Okay? But how come there are so several rows corresponding to these things? Because each clock, every single time something is changed, it will log it. So we can see that you know, there's always something changing here. So between the first row and the second row, what got changed? This got changed. What is that? You go to selection and you can see, oh, it's the microcode pointer that got changed. So when you're in the table, we see the microcode uh, pointer. Oh, okay. I, I scrolled a little bit. But you can see the microcode pointer went from zero to one. And the register, which is register A, never got changed because we are loading it with a zero, but it began with a zero. So we won't actually see register A getting changed because the value has always been zero. Is that okay? Is there mm -hmm. going to be other, our, our case when we're not using registers at all? It's going to be always zero? Is it the same case as in our whole work, we're not using registers? Mm -hmm. Right, so is it going to be equal to zero? Or it will be whatever it is, it's just not changed. So depending on what your program is doing, if your program is implementing a particular register in an infinite loop, then you will still see a register changing all the time. Well, not all the time, but it will be changing per iteration 
because that's what the loop is doing. But the instruction that you're implementing does not should not affect registers at all. Okay. How do you debug this program? How do you test whether the instructions are working or not? What kind of program do you write to double check and make sure your JLI is jumping when it's supposed to and not jumping when it's not supposed to? How do you check that? What kind of program do you write to check to test whether your conditional branches work or not? The unconditional branch is easy, okay? The unconditional branch, you just change this program, change the last two instructions to a JMPI to begin, and you can have the assembler to assemble it, okay? Easy peasy. That's an easy one to test. What about the JLI instruction? How do you test whether your JLI is working or not? Because it is supposed to actually perform the jump when the L flag is set, it is supposed not to branch when the L flag is not is cleared. So how do you uh, come up with test cases to make sure that your implementation of instruction is correct? Okay, subtraction, okay, I like that. How do you force the L flag to be a one? So give me some, Give me the, the math first, okay? Give me the math to make the L flag set. We know comparison is just a subtraction, so what are you going to specify as the first number and the second number in order to force the L flag to be on? What does it mean? What is, what is the L flag really saying when it is set? Well, it's the exclusive or between the sign flag and the overflow flag, yes. But the L flag by itself, you know, it's called the L flag for a reason. L stands for less than, right? But what is less than what in the comparison? The first number is less than the second number. Very good, okay. So in an X minus Y you know, comparison, it means x is less than y. But then we got two ways of less than. We have the signed less than, we have the unsigned less than. Which one is that? It is, if it is unsigned, we have another flag to indicate something that is less than. What is that? I got 10 bucks. <laughs> Borrow. Borrow. Okay, see, see, I, 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 I know that you guys will remember the analogy, even though you may not remember why we have that analogy. <laughs> but as I prompt you, it's like, so it's like, I have 10 bucks, and automatically you guys say, Borrow. Very good. So the carry flag is used for unsigned comparison, which leaves the L flag for Signed comparison. Very good. Okay, very good. So now, to test this, we can now say, well, it seems to me that negative one is less than zero, right? Makes sense to me. Negative one is less than zero. So what you need to do to set up this particular test is to say LDIA with negative one. Except it won't let you specify negative one because you know my assembler written in a spreadsheet doesn't take care of negative numbers. <laughs> so what is the other way to say negative one? Zero minus one won't work either. <laughs> it has to be a non-negative number whose bit pattern so happens to be the same as the bit pattern of negative one as an eight-bit number. So which one would that be? All ones, and all ones using an eight-bit number is which value? Unsigned. One, 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 right? And as an unsigned value, what is it? What What is the value that is represented? 255. Very good. Okay, so good job. So 255 here. LDIB to be zero. Okay. And then you do a CMP AB because CMP is subtracting this uh, is subtracting the second one from the first one. So it is subtracting B from A, which is what we want. So now, in this case, when you say J, uh, JLI to some label L1, okay, it's just space it out with some low-op instructions so it's pretty clear where L1 is 
located. Okay, so L1 can have a halt instruction here. This will test it. Because if JLI does not branch to L1, it said it just moves on to the next node, no up, it's not working. Is that making any sense? Um, how do you make sure that LD, uh, JLI is not branching when it is not supposed to be branching? How do you change, tweak this program to test that instead? Flip the ADs, yep, that's an easy one. So if you flip the ADs, then zero is not less than negative one. So this JLI instruction should not go to L1. Instead, it will continue execution with a no one. Good job. So you have to test it first, okay? You know, just working on the bins, you know, doesn't guarantee that your instruction is gonna work. Um, so you have to test in two cases, you know, for the conditional branches. For unconditional branch, easy, okay? Because, you know, you're supposed to branch to wherever it's going to. So you just need to make sure that branch happens. All right. Any other questions? This is due next Thursday. Okay. The moment you figure out how to do the right slice thing and how to work out the slices, the moment you work out the first instruction, knock it out, test it, and get it to work, the other five instructions will take you less than five minutes. Total. Okay? Now, that's not including the test time, okay? So including test time, maybe, maybe, maybe 20 minutes or something like that, okay? It's not gonna be major. So the main task that you have to do is really to figure out how, what the slices are, okay? And how you want to configure the signals. So looking into the processor architecture, your first task is really to look into this and say, okay, I want to implement a JMPI instruction. How am I going to orchestrate that instruction to happen by controlling these lines? Okay, where do you start? You look into the spreadsheet. Here's JMPI, okay? And in the C, pseudo C notation, that gives you an idea. What are the ingredients that I need? What, what components are exercised in this case? Uh, do I use the register bank? No, so R-I-E, R-I-E-N, and R-O-0-E-N, those things are all irrelevant, okay? The whole register bank doesn't get involved. What about the ALU? Do we use the ALU to do that? Are we adding, subtracting? No. No, okay, so ALU-E-N probably can be a zero, which means ALU cell or OP, you know, the operation is less, you know, doesn't really matter, you can pick anything you want. Because it's, it's not working. Okay, so what, what are we really using in this case? We're using the program counter twice, right? Because we're using the program counter as the pointer. So when you use something as a pointer, what does it really mean? How does it translate to um, the memory bus? The it specifies, it's driving the, the address bus, right? The address line of the of RAM in order to specify which location we're reading from, right? Well, I just said read, right? Okay, so that means something in terms of the bits that you have to control. We're using RAM, we're reading, right? What about the control lines going into the program counter? What do we need? We need it to be enabled because we're gonna change it. Right? So you have to, now you have to control the pathways, okay? From RAM, from the D part of RAM, all the way back to the input of the program counter, there are several boxes in between. So now you have to say, okay, so how do we connect these boxes in order to get that eventually into the input of the register, okay? I have already touched on that today. <laughs> a little bit, a lot, pretty close to what you need. <laughs> okay, so you have to look into that and then figure out, okay, I need this to be a one, I need that to be a zero, and then you look into the jmp.c uh, file, copy that into jmpi.c, make all the necessary changes to the make file, and then just locate the ones that you need to change, change those things, and then run make, which will generate uh, all.rom again. Get all.rom into the wrong 
module of your processor, and then you can test your test program. Use the assembler to test the assemble program, and then test it. I know there are many, many steps, okay? And I know there are, the, the tool chain is really long, right? Because if you just count the tool chain, we have got the processor, we have got the instruction generation mechanism, we have got the assembler that is written in a spreadsheet. So we have all of those you know, components, um, and you have to kind of get to those things to work. So I think you know, the, the process of understanding how the entire tool chain works is probably going to be the bulk of your time. The actual work is not going to be that much. But the whole point of this homework assignment is to get you to understand the processor architecture to look into the pathways, look into how the fluxes and demuxes are connected, and so that you can understand, oh, so this is what happens when we execute this particular instruction. Is that okay? All right, so I'm gonna stop the lecture right now, um, which is basically just to stop the streaming, and then I'll be over at the lab, so for those of you who want to work on the assignment in the lab, we can do that. And the power accounts are all set up too, so you can use a Linux environment to get this done.